Good morning. We want to welcome our Facebook Live people, family with us today. At, uh, we're here in Ringwood, New Jersey at Skyline, Skyline Lakes Fire Department. We meet here every Sunday at 10 o'clock. If you're in there, we'd like for you to join us. And uh, those watching by YouTube, we're glad you joined us as well. I've entered into the season uh, of the resurrection of Jesus. And this last week, God's been put on my heart this, this message on uh, on uh, distractions. And so the title is going to be Distractions. And the dangers of distractions can be life-changing. So we're talking about the distractions today. You know, distractions are all around us. They come from our enemy, from Satan himself, to take us away from God. To isolate us, to take our, our focus away from God, and to keep us from God's best. That's why distractions come. And that brings up a question, who are we listening to? Who are we lending our ears to? Are we lending our ears to the enemy who tells us to do things we shouldn't be doing, to try and distract us from the ways of God, or are we listening to the voice of God who's trying to encourage us to do things he'd have us do? The definition of the word distraction from Webster is something that distracts. It's pretty deep, right? <laughs> <laughs> An object. <coughs> that directs one's attention away from something else. Well, that's a good one. The knowledge that directs one's attention from something else. The act of distracting or the state of being distracted. So distractions come after our attention, to move our attention from one thing to something else. All right? It's very subtle how they come. Isaiah 26.3 says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusted you. Now, this is really the battle of to help us overcome distractions. It's understanding that if our mind is stayed on Jesus, we keep our mind stayed on Jesus because we trust him. Everybody say trust. Yes. So when we truly trust Jesus, our mind will stay on him. Does that make sense? Yeah. When we're distracted away from here, our mind is not on him. Our mind is on something else. The distraction takes our mind and our focus away from God, away from Jesus, and puts it somewhere else to distract us. Why? Because the enemy, remember, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus comes to give us life and give it to us more abundantly. So one is taking life away from us. One is going to give life to us. If we stay focused on the one who gives us life, We'll have the results of that. But if we get distracted, then that can take us away from God. And there's a lot more distractions in the world today than there were even years ago when we, when we all were growing up and we were younger. Our peace depends on us and our ability to lock in to something and not let go of it. Uh, back when I was learning about faith, uh, a lot of the preachers would use this, this illustration and talk about having bulldog type of faith. And what they were talking about, if you take a bulldog and give a bulldog, let's say, a towel, and it grabs that towel in its mouth, bulldog, the breed bulldog has some of the strongest jaws known to the dog world. Only put bulls and spillers have stronger jaws than a bulldog. If you get a bulldog clamping down on something and try to shake that towel away from them, they don't let go. You will tear the towel before they let go of it. And so preachers were using that talk about having the bulldog type of faith, a faith that latches onto the word of God and won't let go of it. And we need more of that in the world today. And we have the ability through the Spirit of God to lock onto things and not let go of them. So if we'll lock into God and not let go of that, then we'll get the benefit from it. Does that make sense? You go to different parts of this country and you find that Jesus mean something different in many parts of the country to different people. And it's phenomenal that he does because he really shouldn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we're worshiping the same Jesus, it'll be the same wherever we go. And you get into a, 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 what I call a true New Testament church, you'll find that to be true. That you'll hear the word of God being preached. When you walk in, it'll feel like family. Because what? Because they're latched on to Jesus. But then you have other people who are distracted from that. Other churches are other uh, members of those churches are, and they're not locked in to Jesus the way others are. And you can hear, see that in their midst. We want to lock in what Jesus has, so what? 
so we have the peace and the freedom God wants us to have. Our peace depends on our ability to keep our mind in one place. Our peace comes with the ability to keep our mind in one place, and that is on him. Jeremy Parsons, the uh, grandson of Kenneth Copeland, had mentioned this in some I read by him this last week, and I thought that was too good not to share that, that our peace depends on our ability to keep our mind in one place. In this country today, in our country today, Satan has really attacked the Christian world in this area of trying to get our mind off of one place, into places. And you get your mind on different places and different things, uh, it can it can not go so well for you. All right? I was going to say this later in the, in the uh, service, but it comes up my spirit now, so I'm going to say it now. Just to show you how easy a distraction can happen. On Saturday mornings, normally when we get up, uh, you know, I'll get up and finish finalizing the message for Sunday. God's going to speak to me all week about. And she'll start making breakfast for us. And then she'll tell me, I'm, you know, be ready in two minutes, in a minute, you know, are, are you ready? So, you get, so I'm ready. So I wasn't really done, but she said, yeah, I'll be, perhaps I'll be ready in a minute. I said, great. So she gets it ready. I shut her thing down. Go sit at the counter in our sugar house. And she comes over to sit down. There's this nice fruit sitting there. Got a little bit of the milk. She poured, poured for me. Plates are all there. The silver, the napkins are all there. She sat down. And I sat down to an empty plate. <laughs> she got so distracted that the eggs were still on the stove. They made scrambled eggs. And they were still sitting there. So instead of me sitting down, I said, oh, I guess we already eat eggs today, right? She had become distracted to a point. She'd never, ever done that, ever. She left the eggs on the stove and sat down to an empty plate. And she saw it about the same time I saw it. And I said, I got it. I'll get it. Something that simple, right? The age of doing is no good sitting on the stove. Thank God it's still in the pants. I didn't get cold. But just a simple thing like that, distracting you away from having eggs. She was admiring you. She was admiring me. Oh, I like that. I like that. They say love is blind. And Chloe got blindsided with her. I must look really good that morning. I thought, I showered already? I had. That must really look nice. <laughs> I'll remember that one. That's good here. <laughs> right. So think about this for a minute. People who don't have peace normally have a wandering mind. Their mind wanders everywhere. They can't focus on anything. They'll tell you they can't focus on anything. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You can focus on anything you choose to focus on. People say, I can't focus. Yes, you can. But you're choosing not to. You're choosing not to. Anybody in any situation, I don't care how, how bad it is in their life, or they think it's bad, whatever place they're at, they can make a decision right then to walk away from that. I was with somebody not too long ago, and uh, I can't focus. And I said, they told me I can't focus. And I said, yes, you can. You're choosing not to focus. And I told the person why they choose not to focus. And they listen and I agree, yeah, you're right. So what you gotta do is come back and focus and don't let your mind wander all these places and get back to the word of God. Put God's word first place in your life, you'll be fine. See? And so when you find somebody, friend, family, whoever has a wandering mind, get them to focus in on the word of God. Now listen to me, if they won't focus on the word, they won't focus on anything else you tell them to do. I learned that years ago. If I'm giving somebody their answer spiritually and they won't take it, then they won't say any they won't take anything else I say to them and do it. And until they do that, I really can't help other than pray, break down the barriers around their life by praying for them and believing God with them. But if they don't want to believe God and don't want to read the word, there's not much I can do other than pray and keep encouraging. You, that's your answer right there. I've told people who should be in mental asylums, you don't need to go there, you don't need to have these type of treatments given to you. You can walk out away from this stuff, this mental depression, everything else you're facing right now. You've chosen to be depressed. You've heard me talk about this before. You made a decision right now to walk away from it. And I got thousands of people who've done that. See? So we've got to keep our mind stayed on the work of it and stayed on Jesus. Don't let your mind wander. What does the word say about what you're distracted from? 
So if you find you're distracted, you might as well have to speak this message while you're watching by uh, Facebook or YouTube later or whether you're here live. Think about this for a minute. What has been distracting you? Now, whatever that distraction is, go to God's Word, find scriptures to take care of that for you, and you start standing in those scriptures and applying those scriptures to your life. If you've been distracted from giving, go back and read the Bible, the Bible has to say about giving. And you'll find out that giving is tied to receiving. That if you don't give, there's no receiving. See? If you're, if you're distracted by a sickness or a disease, go back to what the Word says about sickness and disease. Jesus said, it's by his stripes you were healed. Were is past tense. It means it's already happened. It's already provided the healing. All you got to do is apply that to your life. So you can find that. Again, find your distraction. Go find what the word says about the distraction and apply God's word. And you'll get rid of the distraction. Make sense? Amen. So stay focused. To stay focused, we must receive the word into our lives or it does us no good. You have to receive God's word for yourself or it doesn't do you any good. I can speak to you all day long, but if you don't receive what I, when I speak the word to you, you don't receive the word, it's not going to do you any good. That's what the Bible said over in James about being doers of the word, not hearers only. You only hear it and don't do it, you don't get the benefit of it. But if you hear it and then do it, then the benefit comes. And that's what we want. That's what God wants. Matthew 13 shows us how the seed of the word was sown in four different situations. In three out of these four situations, in 75% of this scripture, the word did nothing for these people. In only 25% did the word do something for them. You remember the, you remember the story over in Matthew 13. We won't read it in the story, but verses 4 and 19 it so shows that some seeds fell by the wayside and the enemy came to devour them. So that word did no good for those people. Number two, some seeds fell on stony ground and got scorched. They withered under the tribulation. There was no roots in themselves. Verses 5 and 6 and verse 21 show us that. Some seeds fell among thorns. The cares of this world, they choked out the word. That was verse 7 and verse 22. So now we've got 75%. Verse 3, the word hasn't helped anybody. Because of these things. The fourth one, some seeds fell on good ground. Everybody say good. 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 Say on good ground. Good ground. That's someone who hears the word, understands it, and it yields a crop. A harvest to them. Some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. So out of those four situations, only one of those did people benefit from. So 75% of the people didn't benefit. 25% did. Are you hearing me? I've been, I've been just saying churches across America today, even spirit-filled churches, this, season, this is true. 25% of people are really reaping and receiving the word of God richly. And 75% of believers are not. It's amazing to me how believers have been so easily distracted by the media, both national media, social media, all sorts of media. How their phones have distracted them. Have you learned this thing here? I mean, I call it my brain until I got everything on here. Everything I need for business, for the church, for me personally, probably family is all here. But this thing has destroyed more people's lives. Because of this thing, two people can't sit down and talk about an issue and have disagreement about the issue and walk away being friends. Because they got used on this thing to turn people up and put people down strongly because they don't have to see them. They just do it on the phone. Yeah. And they'll say anything they want to and pulling people down and destroying people's lives and post it on Facebook, on any social media platform, and just be mean, mean spirited. They've got our society at the point we can't talk to each other without somebody getting mad. And we can't be friends with people who have different views than we do. That's nonsense. That's a distraction from the enemy to destroy a nation. Now we gotta be wiser than the distraction. Are you hearing me? Yep. So we've got to rise up above it. As soon as the word is sown, remember this. I, today, this message on distraction, Satan will try to come to you, whether you're watching my video or here live with us, later tell you, don't listen to that. He knows nothing about what he's talking about. He's wrong. I guarantee you're going to hear it. Why? Because as soon as we sow the word of God into your lives, 
the Bible tells us Satan comes immediately to steal that word. I don't know that. I don't listen to the preachers preach or even read their stuff. Uh, I'll have the devil tell me. When I was putting this message together, he told me, oh, that's not really true. So, well, yeah, it is. Not bind him and get rid of him. I don't listen to him. I don't put up a conversation with him. I bind him and get rid of him. You know, he, he didn't want this message preached. Now, how many of you know that Pastor Kim and I love you all? Amen. Right? Amen. But we love you enough to tell you the truth. It's not our job. Listen, when we preach, we're not ever going to preach condemnation to you. Because that's not what the Word says to do. But we will say things to you that, that the Holy Spirit will use to bring conviction to you. And if you don't listen to the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your life, then it's going to do you no good. And you won't get the benefit of it. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. And I want people, that's why people I listen to who are preaching the Word of God, speaking, reading it, however medium it comes through, I want the Holy Spirit to confront me on things I need to be confronted with. And believe me, He does. He takes His liberty. So know that the angel will come trying to steal the word once it's sown. Why? Because, well, listen to this. Distractions take us out of what we believe. I want to say that again. Distractions take you out of what you believe. That's why I won't let friends, so-called friends, enemies, family, distract me away from the word of God. They know that. If they try to say anything to me that takes me away from God's word, I'm saying no to them. I don't care who they are. And she would never do this, but if Pastor Kim tried to do that, I'd say no to her. I am not allowing anybody, no matter who they are, to distract me away from the word of God, period. I'll stand with God by myself before I allow somebody to pull me away from God. How about you? Hmm? Say. So remember that. Distractions take us out of what we believe. What are some of the distractions? Well, sickness and disease can be one. Lack can be one. Uh, not showing up on time can be one. Make excuses. Disobedience. You know, major distractions, there's others, and maybe we'll be here all day listening. The major distractions are there to get our minds off of God and out of the place of perfect peace. The devil does want you walking around with perfect peace and knowing what the will of God is for your life. He doesn't want you knowing that stuff. So we have to be on guard for it and keep our guard up on it. Does that make sense? Now, listen, I learned a long, a long time ago from my dad, and we weren't, none of us were born again at that time. He always told me, Jerry, respect other people. And, and I said to him as a little boy, why? Well, why should I respect somebody? He said, that's easy. He said, you should respect people because... They're a person that lives on the earth like you do. You want people to respect you? I said, yes, and you respect others. You respect them first, whether they ever respect you or not. And you always be kind to other people. Be nice to them. Why, well, Dad? Because it's the right thing to do. Just do it. You'll have a good life. And again, we were unsaved. He wasn't saved. I wasn't either. But there's a lot of truth to that, of respecting others. So, but before you respect other people, you've got to be able to respect the Word of God. If you don't respect the Word of God and don't respect God, you won't respect other people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so out of that respect, we have to respect the Word of God so strongly that we don't allow anybody to distract us from it. We don't allow people to give us excuses why we should be distracted, why we should leave God and leave the Word of God for something else. Now, there's a good example of this in, in, in the New Testament in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42, about how distractions work. Verse 38, Now it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, talking about Jesus, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. Whose house was it? Martha's. She owned the house. Verse 39, She had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now notice 39, this verse, this is, this is something that people, forget, can we forget about in this, in this passage here? It says, Martha had a sister named Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet. Who also sat at Jesus' feet. Who also sat at his feet besides Mary? Martha was. That's forgotten in the story by most preachers. Mary and Martha both were sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing his word. They sat there to do what? And they says, and heard his word. 
So Mary and Martha are sitting at the feet of Jesus. Imagine, let's see, imagine. If you, Joe, imagine if you have Jesus came and you said, I'm going to sit down, and you were sitting at my feet, and I'm going to teach you. Would that be pretty awesome? Yeah. Really awesome. Really awesome. I'd be listening. You'd be listening. You'd listen to Joe. He's a wise man. Imagine that. And, you know, this is coming to my spirit. That's what we do when we have church. We come together. We worship him. We have to say, speak. Whoever's preaching, speaking the word to us from God's word to help our lives, right? Verse 40, but Martha, there's that word but. Ugh. But Martha was distracted. There's that word again. She was distracted with what? Much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. So Martha's her house. Martha's feeling to be hospitable, take care of her brother. There, Jesus, she's sitting at the feet with, with Mary, being taught by Jesus, and suddenly food becomes more important than he does. She's sitting there in my house. I need, I need to be able to present some food to him, maybe have some coffee, some water, some tea. And that became more important to her than hearing the word of God. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Notice he named her, said her name twice. Why? He wanted to get her attention back. He's trying to refocus her. Martha, Martha, are you worried and troubled about many things? Well, if Jesus is asking you a question, are you troubled and worried and troubled? There's a difference between worry and trouble. Worry leads to trouble. You hear me? You won't be troubled until you, until you worry about something. That's when I learned a long time ago from the Word of God uh, that he, Jesus did not want me worrying about anything. I refused to worry about anything. I cast those things upon him. I've always said this. I don't worry about anything at all. Some things have me more concerned than others, but I don't worry. I never I never not sleep at night because I'm worried about something. I don't at all. I can really shut it off. And you sleep like a baby. You know, and if I'm not sleeping, it's not because I'm thinking or worried. It's just I'm wrestling. I'm too wide awake for whatever reason. But notice this. Martha, Martha, you worry and trouble about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. When you sit at the feet of Jesus, he's telling us and telling Martha, that's the good part. The good part's me revealing God to you. And that's the part that cannot be taken away from Mary because she wasn't worried or troubled and distracted. Make sense? Pretty awesome, huh? Now think about this. They're in an intimate setting, an intimate setting with Jesus, a private, personal meeting with Jesus. You can have one every day by the Holy Spirit if you choose. You can decide to meet with Jesus every single day, whether it's in prayer, just listening, reading his word, but you can do what they're doing every single day. Martha starts off by sitting and listening to learn, but then she became distracted. In the presence, and think about this, there's great revelation flowing from Jesus. They know is increasing in the room and on them. There's life-changing words coming forth. And she allows herself to be removed by serving. By serving. Your enemy knows if you get you distracted, he can get what he wants. Why do we allow him to do this to us? Why do we allow him to distract us away from God, what God wants to have us to have? Think about that. Martha was distracted. I'm going to say this. Listen to this. Martha was distracted because of ministry. Serving is ministry. She allowed the ministry of serving to distract her from Jesus himself. And I can tell you today, there's pastors all over the world, including this country, that are allowing their ministry to distract them from having time alone with Jesus. They need to pray a message on their own without any help from the Holy Spirit, from God, just do it on their own, and they're distracted in their, their ministry. And they don't even know it. They're so deceived, they don't even know it. You know, I traveled, actually for almost 40 years in traveling ministry, I started traveling actually two years after, actually when I got saved. 
I, I started getting invitations to go speak. To, it wasn't always churches. It was to uh, baseball camps, baseball stuff. Uh, I was asked to meet. Asked me, it's funny. As soon as I get saved, I'm asked to be at one of the assistant coaches in the first high school all star game ever, ever in Kansas. And so they helped us to speak to young baseball players and coaches. And, and of course, when I got, I was just going to say, they got full blast all about Jesus. They didn't know they were going to get that from me. And I was so excited about him. But in that essence of that, wanting to share what I learned about God with with everybody, the one thing I noticed is that in the midst of that, not everybody wanted to hear. Not everybody was happy that I did that. But I didn't care. I saw every opportunity that God put me in front of people is I'll never be in front of this group again like this. And I took advantage of it. You know, and speaking the word to them. And so in saying that, uh, your enemy wants to get you distracted so you don't do those type of things. So he can get what he wants. And so if we don't allow him to do that, then we can allow God to have what he God wants to have us in our lives by allowing us ourselves not to be distracted. Pastors can see the enemy's distractions in their congregational lives every week. It's heartbreaking as a pastor to look at them among a congregation and see them falling for the deceptions of the enemy when they should know better. When they're going through things they never would have to go through if they wouldn't be distracted. If they just fully commit to Jesus, they wouldn't have the problems they have in their lives. And not the same way as a pastor. I see things in the lives of, of members of this church, and it just breaks my heart. Why are you allowing that to, that distraction to happen in your life? Why are you allowing that to pull you away from God? See, it breaks your heart. Uh, since I traveled all those years in churches, I was always amazed before the service that I, I usually would be in what was called the green room, where they put speakers in an isolated room by themselves. Usually there's, you know, water and beverages there. The pastor will come in or send something to get you when the service is about ready to start. Or be in the pastor's office. He used to meet him with the pastor before the service. And it'd be shocked how many of these pastors would get up, go pick out their office and see how many people are, are, are in church. Say, how many people are here today? One in Oklahoma, I can remember, he's always nervous. He's always going back and seeing who's out there and how many people are there. You know why they were so concerned about how many people in the service? Because they wanted to make sure I got a good offering. And I'd always tell him, it doesn't matter how many come. And then I had him apologize. I said, I'm sorry, we didn't have a full house. And I said, don't worry about it. But I want your offering to be. I said, God's my source, not you. Amen. Not your check. Your, your whatever, whatever you plan is to save my life, it'll be fine. Because God's my source, you're not. Mm-hmm. I had one time, I went, I told about a person I tried to ministry. I would go based on money. I wouldn't go based on size of the people, group I was going to speak to. I've gone to one, I told myself, I'll go around the whole world with one person, if, if, as long as you're sending me, you got to be sending me. So I was in a church one time, and we had three people. And the offering they gave me was bigger than a church I've been in that had 1,500 in it. God knows how to keep a traveling minister humble. Because you never, you never try to gauge the offering by the size of the congregation. Because it only takes one check. One offering from one person to blow the doors off the offering. I've had three people who gave more than 1,500 gig. Isn't that amazing? I had places that should have been big bucks that gave me nothing, and places that should have given me no bucks that gave me huge offerings. And every time I do that, I just laugh. So I never looked at I never looked at a check that was handed to me when I left in front of the pastor, unless they ask you to. Why? Because your face will react one way or the other. I would put, I'd thank them, pray over them, and pray over the, the offering, and pray that their people would be blessed by giving, the church would be as well. And I'd wait until I got on the airplane or in the car, away from them. And sometimes I wouldn't look, look until I get, I forget, I wouldn't look until I get, you know, get home. My wife would say, how was the offering? I don't know, I haven't looked at it. And then I'd look at it, you know, in front of her. But Kim has seen that, so we've been married, the same type of thing happening. And she'll tell you. She'll just shake her head. That group did that. Right? There's a little church in Arkansas. And uh, we go back there, and we'll go back this summer, and uh, I'll go there on Wednesday night, and there's probably 10, 10 people. And we start talking to them about the idea of coming here and starting a church. 
They gave us a thousand dollars before we started the church, for the church. That night with ten people, and that's we think, we think what that does. It showed us, wow, God is in this. Are you hearing me? And so remember that. If you stay focused, you're not distracted with what God wants you to do. Good things are going to happen for you. Amen. Amen. Members of any church should do these three things. I used to preach this all the time. Our pastors preach it to our church in Tulsa. Number one, you should attend. If you're a member of, a, of this church, anytime we have a major service, you should be here if at all possible. You should be here. All right? Now, we know there's things that come up. People sometimes get sick. Uh, go on vacation, leave town. We know all that. That's fine. But if you're in town and everything's well, you should be here. That's what being a member of a church is. You're the church, not me and Pastor Kim, so it's your church. You should be here. And be faithful in your attending and be on time for it. Secondly, you should give your money and give your time. Every member of a church should faithfully attend and faithfully give. And then thirdly, everybody should faithfully serve. Find some place that God's put in your heart to serve in the church. And all of you out here among our church, and in our very beginnings, uh, all everybody in this room does something to help us. There's no one people who aren't here today. There's no one who comes to church that doesn't do something to help us. It's phenomenal. We are a serving church. And I'm grateful for that. We're thankful that you guys are like that. Notice Martha was running around. The Reese translation says this, that Martha was going around in circles over occupied. Martha was going around in circles over occupied. I think that's pretty funny. I can see her just running circles trying to get the food ready. And Jesus addressed Martha, Martha, Martha's problem. He confronts her. He confronts her. Now remember this. If I ever confront you personally and privately about something, it's because I want you to get the benefit of what you're not doing. Are you hearing me? Jesus confronted her. He didn't shy away. He didn't play patty cake with it. He confronted her face to face. He tells her she's worried and she's troubled, and he's basically telling her she's lost her peace. Jesus tells her the one thing is needed. He uses Mary as an example to Martha, but tells her, Martha, there's one thing you need, and Mary has the part you need. That's the good part, and that cannot be taken away from her, but it's the word. Now he's saying, Martha, if you do what Mary did, come back and sit on my feet, forget about that stuff, and hear the word, then the word will do for you just like it will for Mary. It can't be taken away from you either. In other words, he gave her the answer to what she had need of. So Mary's going to see the see the seed of God's word take root in her life and produce fruit in her life. He's trying to get Martha to get there, get back to that same place that Mary was at. How would you like Jesus himself to guarantee you? Joe, what if you had that face to face encounter with Jesus? He, he guaranteed you, guaranteed it, that basically whatever word he's speaking to you, it would come to pass in your life if you believed it. I would stand on it. And you would stand on it. Yep, you would. You stand on that word. And see, that's what we do when we start preaching the word. Remember, who's ever preaching? Me, but you give somebody else. You take that word, if it's from the Bible, and stand on that word, it'll produce for you. If you don't, it won't. See. This, like I said before, the ministry distracted Martha by Mary. Mary. Mary didn't focus on the ministry. She focused on Jesus. Are you hearing me? I've told preachers this. I've been Bible scholars to teach future preachers this. And I would tell them this. And we had some private, some classes I taught. We got to the nitty gritty of ministry. And I would share with them. And I would say this to them. I'll say it to you. Jesus is more interested in you personally than he is your ministry. I'll say that again. Jesus is more interested in you personally than he is your ministry. He's more concerned by you as a person. That you sit with him, get your trust from him, that you're at his feet, you do what he wants you to do, than what he than the work he has for you to do. He can care less about the work, he's more concerned about you. He can care less and more about what you're doing for him and with him than he would how you're doing. He's more concerned about you, the person. Never forget that. And when he knows the relationship with him is right. Then the ministry, listen to this, becomes the overflow 
of your personal relationship with Jesus. When Pastor Kim and I speak, what you're seeing is the overflow of our personal relationship with Jesus. You're, you're getting the overflow of it. All right? Same thing for you. If you're speaking God to somebody, you're doing something in ministry, they're getting the overflow of your personal relationship with God as well. So the overflow is important. So you can help other people's lives. So to tell Jesus we're too busy because of doing the ministry is foolish and can be devastating. I remember Oral Roberts saying this years ago. He called them the three G's. Just a laugh at me talk about three G's. You get in front of the ministers, you know, at the conferences at ORU. You know, you have 10,000 people there and you tell them. He said, I'm telling you, there's some of you out here that need to hear this. He said, in all my years of ministry, I've never touched the three G's. So then he let us sit there a minute and go on. What's the three G's? <laughs> he said, I never touched the gold. I never touched the glory. And I never touched the cows. Now you think about it. In any minister's life who has fallen, it's either power, sex, or money. They don't fall for any other reason. There's an international leader right now who has now fallen in ministry. A world-renowned, I mentioned the name, you know him, in his ministry. And he fell because of the gals, the power, not so much the money, but the gals and the power. It means you misuse both of them, now it's coming up, now he's had his own. So let that be a lesson to all of us. Guys, leave the gals around alone, unless they're your wife. If you're single, it's a little bit different, but still, be godly. Leave the money around alone. You can't steal from God and get what you with it. And never take the glory away from God. Always give Him the glory. You do those three things, you're a little good life. Ladies, don't touch the guys the wrong way. Don't touch God's money the wrong way, and don't you try to take the glory either. Don't you ever try to take the glory away from Jesus? I, I've known situations in churches uh, there were women were praying, praying, praying. No, not praying, but praying, P R E Y I N G. We're praying on the men of the church and prostituting themselves and letting the men come in their house and live for them as long as they paid the bills. In return, they would have given sex. And that's happening more than one church. You'd be shocked. And so I, I know and see, I've seen it happen. All right? I've seen it happen in your state, here in New Jersey. So what I'm saying to you is don't touch the opposite of sex the wrong way, don't touch the money the wrong way, and don't take the glory the wrong, from God, and you'll be fine. All right? Now it's quiet when you talk about that. Really quiet. Mm -hmm. but these are the three big areas that not only ministers, but believers fall in. Now, why would anyone look like intimacy with God for the sake of ministry? What happens every day? Martha was a woman whose mind was on the Word. It shows us her mind was on the Word. She, she was in the presence of Jesus in an intimate environment, hearing the Word like she'd never heard before. She was in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing, and then a thought carried her away. And the thought was, oh, I need to serve these people food. Well, one thought can distract you away from the will of God for your life. Don't allow that to happen. That's why the Bible tells us to capture every thought and put it under the obedience of the Word of God. There's thoughts that come to you and I all day that are not from God. They come from our own mind sometimes, and sometimes Satan tries to throw them in from the outside. You know, just because you think it doesn't mean you have to do it. That's pretty good. Just because you think it doesn't mean you have to do it. And listen, listen, I'm going to listen the hard way, but I'll mention this, you've already said this before. But just because somebody asks you to do something doesn't mean you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Just because someone asks you to do something doesn't mean you have to do it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes family will ask you to do things you should never be a part of. Because it becomes a distraction. And you got to know where, where that line is. And throw that line. See? Mm -hmm. Two mills were served in Martha's house that way, that day. Two mills were served. One by Jesus, one by Martha. Which one do you think was more important? Jesus. 
the one that Jesus had. Think about Martha for a minute. If you were there with her, if you were married, you started getting jittery, started getting food ready, he's like, why prepare a meal now? I just look, I hear Mary just say, Martha, why would you prepare a meal now? Don't you remember what this guy did with some fish and some bread? What are you so concerned about? Remember the fish and the bread? Why would you go do that? This is the fish and bread guy. He can multiply anything. You don't even have to cook when he's around. You know, but she's doing the thing that way. She could have said, I'm not moving a muscle. I'm staying right here at his feet. I'm going to get everything he wants me to have. But she didn't do that. Had she done that, though, Jesus would have made sure that fruit had been produced in her life. But she didn't give the word first place. She got distracted. When you are distracted and you're li you are listening and obeying Satan's, Satan's instructions to you, he's trying to lead you away from God. Wake up. Shake Satan's plan off of your life. Obey God's word. You know what to do. As Nike says, just do it. You know what to do, just do it. Your obedience to Jesus will bring you peace and freedom. What do you want? You want peace, freedom, or torment? See? It is... Use the right word here. It is mystifying to pastors when people choose to go back to torment when they've had peace and freedom. It just mystifies it. Like, why would you do that? You've come out of that. You've been delivered from that. Why would you ever go back to that? And I guess one of the reasons for, for a lot of us in that, I know for me, I was so radically saved. I was so messed up. I was so radically saved. that When I sold out to Jesus, uh, I've never not been sold out to him. All right? Uh, I've never done that. I mean, you know, I think about a simple thing about coming to church. What if Pastor Kim and I decide not to come to church on Sundays? Or oh, we'll, we'll come at 11 o'clock this, this next Sunday as your pastors. Would you stay around this long, long if we did that? If you know if you know, we know we'd come be here or not? You know, there's a few times a year we're not here, but somebody else is here. The church is still going. You know, there's a few times here and there we're not here. But mostly, we're basically, we're here every week for the most part. Right? Nobody we say, ah, let's go later today. Right? Let's jump out at 1045. Wait, wait, let's start preaching around 11. Or, yeah, let's go about 11. You, now, do you see the, the craziness of that? And then we have people doing that in our churches. See? You see, you think nothing of it. Why? Because they're distracted. Everybody say this with me. I will... I will not be distracted away from church, away from God. I will remove all distractions, stand strong, and follow Jesus. Because your obedience to Him will bring you peace and freedom. Remember that. Here's the deception. Here's the deception for bring us to close today. The deception is this you think that you're all right. You think it's all right to miss praise and worship in church. Show up later. You think it's all right? I know things come up that, that would cause us to be late, maybe be late. I understand. I'm not talking about those exceptions. I'm talking about on a weekly basis. Okay. The, the deception is you think you're all right. I'll make the change later. Later never comes. Wake up. Make the change now. Commit now. Recommit yourself now. What are the distractions Satan has you doing that take you away from God? They can be good things. But they're not God things. Giving your mind to other things or other people, showing up late to church and appointments, makes making choices why you can't, saying I'll do that later, telling God you just don't understand. Why do you keep allowing yourself to be distracted? Wake up and make a change today. Make a change today. Decide to keep your mind on God's word. Decide to be a part of the 25% who receive the word of God. Not the 75% who don't. Be part of the 25% that do. Are you hearing me? Mm -hmm. Stay and receive. Listen to this. Or go and serve. Martha went and served and lost. 
some intimacy with God. It's your choice. I encourage you to stay and receive. Mark should have stayed and received like Murray did. Put God first in all you do, all the time. No more excuses. This will keep saying from stealing the word that God has for you. Your peace will come. Your freedom will come with it. Choose God. Listen to his word. Listen to his spirit. And obey his word and obey his spirit. If you do that, you'll stay connected. You won't be distracted and you'll get the benefits of it. Are you hearing me? Yes. And quit talking the problem. Quit, talk, quit talking, woe is me. I got all, no, stop that. You're giving Satan a foothold and you're distracted already by your highlighting him instead of the word of God. Start highlighting If you can't say anything else, just say the word. If you can't say the word, just zip your lips and keep your mouth shut. Don't poison your life by letting junk come out of your life about yourself. Get yourself saying, I'm the head, not the tail. Don't ever say I'm the tail, and I'll never be the head. Say, no, the Bible says I'm the head, not the tail. So I choose to believe I'm the head and not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'll never be beneath another day of my life. So I'm the head, not tail, above and not beneath. The word's working for me. Anyone who doesn't look like it's working, just say the word is working. If he has anything else, just say the word is working for me now. And then apply it to your life and watch it work. The don't allow your mouth to speak the vile poison of Satan to destroy you with. And make a commitment to God. That you're hanging on to him. You're going to sit at his feet all the time. Because if you do that, then your life will be well. And you'll be well. You'll be happy, healthy. You'll be prosperous. You'll have the joy of the Lord. You'll have a lot in your step. And people wonder, what is different about them? And God will give you the opportunity to tell them what it is. Amen? Amen. So choose not to be distracted. Choose to be connected and stay connected at the feet of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Those of you watching my video, thanks for watching. Those watching my Facebook live, thanks for tuning in. And remember this, Jesus is Lord.